Nope. Oh, is there a clicker? Where's the clicker? Uh, ah. Yeah. Okay, let's see if that works. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> I just need to get to the next page. There we go. I'll just do this. Is it working now? Uh, yeah, to go forward and press it down. And to go back, I go up? Yeah. Okay, so what's the mock? Uh, it's a public-private group that got together to say, we want to create a public cloud. We have about 400 users. Some of those users are serving over 10,000 other users. So they're running things on the, the cluster that support lots of other researchers. It's hosted at the Mass Green High Performance Computing Center. This is a two-acre data center in Holyoke, Massachusetts. It's Platinum LEED certified. And one of the cool things about it is it has high-speed fiber connecting the entire Northeast region. Our planned upcoming growth over the next six months or so is that the Northeastern Storage Exchange is going to be standing up a 20 petabyte data lake at the MGHPCC, and it's going to be integrated with the MOC. So you'll be able to do compute against really large data sets. IBM is putting 11 Power9 servers in. They're each going to have a terabyte of memory and four GPUs. There are about 5,000 cores coming over from Harvard over the next six or eight months. And as we just discussed in the past couple of days, we're really excited that the Red Hat Data Hub is going to be standing up on the MOC. So you guys probably already knew this. Most of today's clouds are run by one company. They basically don't share their data. And that makes it really hard both for us as researchers within the university setting, but it also has an impact on folks who want to do optimizations. For example, all of us working on open source. So four or five years ago, uh, Peter and Oran Krieger uh, got together with a couple of other researchers and thought there should be a different model possible. And so the idea of an open cloud exchange is that you have a mechanism that allows you to take information, or, or sorry, compute from one provider, GPUs from another provider, storage from yet a different provider, and plug them all together so that they plug and play together. But it also, the ideas behind this also lead to the concept of having um, a level playing field so that a big company and a small company, or you or me, could create our own services and offer them to anybody. And so as we thought about that, we said, what are the things that would be necessary to create a minimal viable product? We need production cloud services. We need to have a method for single sign-on that allows us to use the resources across multiple providers. We need to have a billing model. We need to have res uh, elastic hardware. And we need to have research federation. And the MOC is a production cloud service. We offer single sign-on through Keystone. We have a billing model. We have Elastic Hardware, and we're working on that. So why do we actually care about this as essentially part of a group of research universities and, and private industry? Um, we care because you can't do open source development and you can't do research if you don't have access to real data, access to real users, and access to scale. And we all know the story of the cathedral and the bazaar. If we open things up, then we end up in a situation where we have improved efficiency, more competition. It's a better outcome for everybody. That's why we care. Why should the community care? Well, there's a lot of reasons. But one of the big ones that we keep running into as we break them up is there's no place to run continuous integration and deployment at scale. So there's lots of issues that don't get found until they show up at the customer site 
or in our case, at the MOC. Um, and some of those are because of interface changes that get missed between different projects or they get out of sync. Some of those are because they only begin to show up at scale. Some of those are because the implementers were solving a different set of problems than what we need in running a commercial cloud. And some of it's just because as you get to large quantities of users, you start to see, as I mentioned before, really different scales and types of problems. So we're going to look at four ways that we've broken the cloud. I'm sure there's more, but these seem like good illustrations. We've had major storage failures. We've run into problems trying to stand up telemetry for our cloud. We've run into problems trying to do chargeback and showback. And I think we're one of the early folks who's been doing a lot with OpenShift on OpenStack, and we've run into problems there too. So I want to tell you about the great mock Ceph upgrade of August 2017. It was a really simple plan. Do it in August. There aren't a lot of users because we're a research cloud, right? We're trying to essentially triple the size of our Ceph cluster. Nothing could go wrong here, could it? Unfortunately, or should I say fortunately, nobody was eaten by a velociraptor. But seriously, it was a disaster in every way possible. Well, I don't know about in every way possible. Nobody died, nobody got eaten. But let's get this out of the way up front. We lost all the data. Like, what's the one thing you want your cloud to not do? You don't want it to lose your data. And we yes. Peter's pointing out uh, the 170 terabytes was three quarters full. So there's some good news. We did a really good job of telling people, make sure your data is backed up. And pretty much all the users were OK. And that's really good. <sighs> but there's a really embarrassing thing that I need to share with you. Um, we believe in eating our own dog food. And so our web page was running on our VMs backed by Ceph and not properly backed up. So we lost. Yeah. We it, might as well get it out of the way. We, we were the people primarily affected. So how did this actually happen? So remember, this was our plan, triple the scale, triple the size. So this is some really important background. Our cluster started out as a Fujitsu appliance. And it had a lot of placement groups, something like 10 times as many placement groups as would be recommended for something that wasn't a Fujitsu appliance. And it's also important to note, we weren't changing versions. We were just adding storage. And there's a pretty well-known, clear mechanism for taking advantage of the failure recovery. You add an OSD. It remaps everything. It adds the data, to, spreads the data out. What we didn't know was that that version of Ceph also stored every bit of history for every change you'd ever made. And no one had ever tried it with so many placement groups before. And there was another thing. If you're adding a whole bunch of OSDs, you want to actually minimize the amount of time that you're driving out an hour and a half to Holyoke and putting the drives in. So we put a bunch of drives in all at the same time. And we got a live lock. It would come up, it would crash. It would come up, it would crash. And what makes it really particularly painful um, is that we got RAM and we drove out, well not we, these guys, <laughs> Peter, drove out and upgraded the RAM. But it turned out, as we learned later, there probably wasn't enough RAM in the universe to actually help us in this situation. Um, so how did it end? We reached out to Red Hat and the community for help. 
and the community in Red Hat said, let us help you, which was awesome. Um, I'm pretty sure that folks didn't say it to us, but said to themselves, oh my God, why weren't they using supported bits? Oh my God, what the hell were they thinking? But as... Oh, we were using supported bits at that point? <laughs> okay. <laughs> As I said, I'm the storyteller here. An unsupported config on supported bits. Uh, see, I'm learning new parts to this story. <laughs> so how do we fix it? Um, I don't actually know how many, how long this went on. Was it weeks? Yes, long enough that Rado would go there. Ah, yes. Our, Rado, who is our, our infrastructure engineer, this was planned so that it wouldn't impact his vacation. So it was like a month before he was leaving, right? Three weeks, a month. We've learned a really important lesson. Don't schedule anything even remotely near when Rado's going on vacation, because every time he goes on vacation, bad things happen. Um, so the first try involved a script, because there was no way to recover from this other than manually. So we, there was a script that we tried to create with a lot of help. And unfortunately, there was a bug in the script. And the way that it was described to me was the Ceph cluster became Swiss cheese. Four megabyte holes got stuck throughout the master boot record and all over the place. Um, so we rebuilt the Ceph cluster from scratch. Now, this is a really interesting thing, and, and there's something really magical about the open source community, because when you can actually reach out to the guy who essentially wrote Ceph and say, hey, are we doing this right this time? It's really kind of amazing. So thank you, Sage. <laughs> um, so then there was the smaller Ceph outage. This one will be quicker. Data centers are never supposed to lose power, right? Well, Peter's going to tell us how this one actually happened because he has a better, more details on it than I do. Okay, so I think, yeah. Um, so basically, you need some type of fire suppression in a, uh, you know, in a data center, and. Really, there isn't anything better, or especially if you're trying to make code, than sprinklers. At the same time, if you have 400 volt uh, AC for your distribution to all the racks, you really don't want to sprinkle 400 volts. So, um, and you also don't want water in the sprinkler pipes normally, because over time, some sprinkler heads will fail, and you'll sprinkle expensive equipment and 400 volts. So they have this fancy setup with a high-tech uh, smoke alarm that basically sucks air from above the racks into a central thing, and the sprinkler pipes are empty. And then the first phase, then when the smoke alarm fires, it fills the sprinkler pipes, and then the sprinkler heads work like normal, heat activated. However, once the water enters the sprinkler pipes, again, we don't want to sprinkle 400 volts, especially if I'm in one of the racks, um, it triggers an emergency power off. No generator, no nothing, emergency power off. And there's also a feature to test the valves that trigger the emergency power off that was used when they were building the building. There are some little valves that, you know, I think they look like the ones for your garden hose that will let water in past each of the valves so that you can test that the power off trips, which they did before there were any computers there. Now, one of those had been cross-threaded and it started leaking a little bit. So some maintenance guy went, saw a leaking faucet. You know, this is on the computer floor. It's like 100 decibels or something. You know, two acres of racks of computers. He cranks the valve harder, trying to get it to stop dripping. Evidently, that caused it to do the opposite. The water went through the valve. It triggered the emergency power off. So he must have been standing there, and the whole floor went quiet. 
So I can't repeat whatever it is that he said, uh, I'm sure, but uh, it's not a situation that I would want to be in. Uh, but it wasn't his fault. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that that's one of the more fascinating outages I've heard a root cause of. Uh, it took a while to figure out why that happened. Yeah, it, so basically there was an open conference call from the moment that happened until the moment it was resolved. And when the power came back on, this is a, the summary of the bug. Power outage at data center. VMs came up without Ceph access. Turns out there was a configuration problem that we didn't realize we'd made. The newest VMs didn't have permissions to break the old locks. It was a known issue. By the time we figured out that it was a known issue, we'd basically manually unlocked all the images. So the cluster in this case was not available roughly overnight. Um, these are some of the folks who helped us. Thank you, Michael Kidd. Thank you, Emma and Janatha. And thank you, Larsh, who works for Hugh and spends a huge amount of time helping us get the mock operationally more 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 rigorous. So that was our major storage area, our storage failures. Telemetry data. So we care a lot about telemetry data. And we care about it because we want to do research. A lot of the interesting research right now is not coming out of academia as much as it is out of private companies because they've got the data. Um, we want that information to be available to researchers, and we want it to be available to the community so you guys can do optimizations on things. And so we figured out we should do something about this. And so in late 2015, early 2016, we stood up Solometer. And it was very slow. And it led to network slowdowns. And it led to situations where jobs wouldn't finish because the network was so slow. So we investigated Manas Manaska. And Manaska looked pretty good. We were using it pretty, pretty reasonably. Um, but the thing is, we also, remember we talked about wanting to do chargeback and showback? Showback is when you go to the partner universities and you say, see how much compute resources and storage resources you're using? We really would like you to help fund it, support it, all those sorts of discussions. Chargeback and showback. They seem pretty straightforward. Like AWS, when I was there, sent me a bill every month. Couldn't always understand it, but they sent it to me. We didn't realize that we were on the bleeding edge. And it wasn't even like what we wanted to do was that hard from our perspective. So this is sort of the report we'd like to generate. I'm going to pull out the parts that matter for the MVP. We wanted a report per project with some pretty standard things. The project name, sponsoring organization, per VM compute usage, per VM, use, per VM memory usage. I think I left off uh, storage, like block storage stuff. Pretty simple. We wanted a second report, projects by institution, so that we could go to Harvard, we could go to MIT, we could go to BU, and we could say, this is what's going on. This is actually really makes a lot of sense. You should, you should put more money into this. And for that, again, the MVP was pretty simple. Project name, project lead name, compute usage, memory usage. I think I also left off storage usage. And we, we wanted literally, by institution, one line with each of those things. It seemed pretty simple. Originally, we were going to pull the data together ourselves and generate the reports. Remember, at this point, it was probably late 2017. And then we heard about cloud forms, and it looked really cool. There was just one thing, it needed Solometer. So we went back and we looked at Solometer again. And it wasn't easy, but we became convinced that it was actually really performant. And in fact, I think it's fair to say it, it has been. 
we started running it on a test system and it seemed to work pretty well. But then we tried to generate reports. And it was hard because our data was living in different places. Some of it was coming from RabbitMQ around CPU usage. Some of it was coming right out of Solometer. Some of it was coming from another, another database file. And they weren't all accessible via cloud forms. And we were talking to some of the guys who were really deeply involved with cloud forms and they would say, oh, that's a really cool use case. We should figure out how to do that. But it's not going to be in the next version. <laughs> And so we went back and we said, okay, we're going to generate our own reports for now. And this was another thing that went on that was frustrating. Um, so CloudForms did something kind of cool. It updated itself. But the problem was there was something messed up with our RubyGems configuration, and it, it took us several days to get it working again. But this is really critical, both for research and for doing an open cloud exchange. And I want to take a second to dwell on it. That's kind of why I made it in bold. If you want to offer services to everybody and you want to be able to cover your costs, there's got to be a basic billing model. There's got to be a mechanism that allows us to charge for usage. And it just is really hard to do right now. All the folks who are doing this now are writing custom things. And so lay, please let me make a plug. If there's anybody in the room who's working in this space, please raise your hand and come and talk to us because we would really like to collaborate on it. And it's worth noting, we found a couple of groups within Red Hat and other places that are working on this. And we're going to be working, reaching out to them to figure out if there's a way, a way that we can work more closely with them. But what we have now works for an MVP. But what we have now isn't going to work when each of us want to offer a service and, and get some remuneration for it. So we've got we to gotta fix that. Here are some of the folks who helped us. Again, thank you, Lars. <laughs> thank you, Adam Young. Thank you, Jason Rittenauer. And thank you, Sumain Chen. These guys were really, really patient and really, really helpful at pointing us in the right directions. So we've talked about major storage failures. I want to come back to that for a second, though. One of the things that's really been fascinating is that the research that we've been doing on the MOC has, to a great extent, begun moving off of things like Manaska and Solometer and more towards tracing and more to things like open tracing. And what's really interesting about that, and, and talking to, to Mania, who spoke about this yesterday, and talking to Raja, who um, is, uh, I think, you're, is it accurate? He's your PhD advisor, right? No? Peter's your PhD advisor. So Raja's doing a lot of work on tracing. Um, is that the guys who are working on, op on, on the open tracing stuff are already thinking about the fact that, hey, with open tracing, we're going to be able to do really, really detailed level of, of chargeback and showback and billing. And so this is an area that we think there's a lot of interesting overlap both between research and between the larger community. And we'd really like to figure out ways to, to, to work on that more. So, OpenShift on OpenStack. I don't know that we are the only people doing this. In fact, I know we're not. But it feels like it a lot of the time. Um, and this is just a funny pun. Shift on stack on split stack, because we're going to be running split, tack, split stack, which is a triple O thing. But what are the, some of the things that we've run into that have broken OpenShift for us? Um, one of them was we went to update from 3.7 to 3.9 in an OpenShift on stack environment. And at least for us, it didn't work. And as far as I can tell, there's problems with it. Um, it's not just us, in other words. Um, here's some other stuff. And I should call out Rob, who's our subject matter expert on this, isn't here. So if you guys want deeper details, I'm going to get contact information and we'll, we'll have a, a discussion about it. Um, we ran into some fun stuff with Ansible. Uh, we started out by just using IP addresses. 
in order to get the information over to Kubernetes correctly. But some things don't like that. Some of the different parts didn't like that. So it turned out we really needed to have DNS just for OpenShift. Um, I think you guys probably already know this, but DNS name resolution between OpenShift and OpenStack, there's stuff going on there. It's really hard. Um, certificates have been another really huge area of pain for us. Um, some of that's probably because maybe we were using unusual certificates. I don't know. But one of the things we ran into was, so it turns out that if the first system with the etcd gets corrupted or goes down, then all of your certs fail. Probably not where we want to be, probably not where we'll be in three months, but these are the things that we've run into trying to, trying to run a production cloud. So again, it's really, really critical, I think, all the people who've been amazingly helpful about this, starting with Dan, who must be one of the most, I don't know if Dan is in the room, but he, if you haven't met him, he must be one of the most patient and, and smart guys I've ever come across. Um, Rafael Aceveda, Sam Padgett, Aaron Wittekamp, and Daniel Jeffrey, they've all, some of them just in the past week or so have become involved to help us solve some of these cert problems. Um, and we're really grateful for that. So some things we've learned. This is a really important one that I wish we didn't do this about as often as we do. Anytime we think a project or rel feature will work, we ask, are any current customers using it this way? And it turns out that often they are, but often they aren't. Usually we just ignore the fact that we asked the question, which is on us. Five minutes? Okay. If Rado's out of town, bad things will happen. <laughs> we learned that too. This is a really important one for us because we are very grateful for the close relationship we have with Red Hat. But when we open a ticket, if it's critical, we ask somebody at Red Hat to help us sort of nudge it along. Um, Larsh is a, I don't know if you guys know Larsh, but Larsh is, is this wonderful developer who's helped us a huge amount. And any time I start to write an email, I literally hear him in the back of my mind going, why is this not a Trello card? And so that's a really powerful thing. And it's really important. I'm pretty sure I forgot to say thank you to some of the many people who've helped us both within the community and within Red Hat. And so please let this thank you go to the people I may have not known about or forgotten. And he wasn't supposed to be here, so this next one is also really important to point out. Please, if you see Hugh, who's sitting right there, say thanks, Hugh. Thank you. But don't tell him why. <laughs> It'll be pretty amusing if he doesn't know. Any questions? Anybody who wants to work on some of these cool problems that we're talking about? Oh, come on. Nobody's raising their hands. It's okay, we'll hunt you guys down and find you. Okay. Thanks.